So hear now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of John, reading from the second chapter, verses 18 through 22. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And may God bless the reading of his word to our understanding this morning. Let's ask him to bring it alive. Our dear Lord, as you tell those around you in the time that you spent here on earth about the resurrection, You pretty much put all of redemptive history into one verse. And I just pray that you will give me the words this morning as we study these words that will bring that alive, that you will speak through the words and that the glory of your resurrection and the glory of your redemption would shine through in each one of our hearts and minds this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I've already told you, and let me just tell you again, that our operative word this morning is the word resurrection. And let me just repeat it. I'm going to repeat it several times. When we talk about resurrection, we talk about the bodily, historical, physical, supernatural resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're not talking about a metaphor. We're not talking about symbolism. We're talking about an actual resurrection. But when we put it into the terms that Jesus has stated here in the 19th verse, which is pretty much where we're going to spend our time, and and he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, some other words come into mind that are brought about and are important there as well. Words like redemption, words like righteousness, like restoration, like reconciliation, and relationship. And I know you think I stayed up all night just to try to think of all those words that started with the letter R, but I didn't. I mean, they just happened to flow together. They all start with R. There's some other words that we need to consider this morning that don't start with R. Words like temple and forgiveness and, very importantly, destruction. Because that's pretty much what Jesus is specifying here. He has come as the restorer to destroy man's destruction. I know I'm going to have to kind of explain that as we go along. Let me give you a brief overview here to see if I can sort of put some of these words into its perspective before we get started. Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We're going to go back there again later on, but let's just start there. Now, in the Garden, Adam and Eve had two things, two of these words. They had perfect righteousness, sinlessness, And because of that, they had relationship, perfect relationship with God. That was the establishment in the beginning. That's the way that they were first created. Now, you'll notice that there was no temple there. There was no temple in the garden because there was no need for a temple. God is the temple, and the entire world was the place to worship God. Now, let's fast forward all the way past this sordid human history that we're in the middle of, and let's go to the very end of time, and let's take a look at the new creation, the new Jerusalem, the new world that is going to be created when the eschaton comes about, and we will find that it's exactly the same thing. We will see that there is relationship that has been restored because of the perfect righteousness of everyone who lives there in fact we can read that in the book of revelation because again there's no temple because there is no need for a temple and i saw no temple in the city for its temple is the lord god the almighty and the lamb so we start with perfect righteousness and relationship and we end with perfect righteousness and relationship but when we look at the ending We've got to think about those other words because some things have happened that weren't necessary in the garden. Things like 
redemption, things like restoration, things like forgiveness, things like a reconciliation with God so that the sins have been forgiven. All of that is necessary now because of that one word that I told you that is so important, destruction. Because you see, what we have done is we have destroyed the relationship that God originally had with us. We are the destroyers. And that is what we're going to bring out as we make our way through our text this morning. Let me put it into a little bit of context. Jesus is standing in the middle of the temple. And the temple has gone completely corrupt by this time. Religion is completely apostate. And he comes into the temple and he sees that they're selling animals, making a fortune off of them because they're selling sacrificial animals at a ridiculous, exorbitant price. And they are making money on the exchange of money because they would only accept a certain kind of gold to buy the animals. And so Jesus is in full confrontational mode when he says this. He's turned over the tables. He has kicked them out. He's made a whip. He's driven the animals out. And a group of Jews come up to him. Now, when, when I use the word Jews, and I use it advisedly because that's exactly what it says here, I'm not talking about ethnic Israel. I'm not talking about any race of Jews. I'm talking about those religious leaders who were hostile to Jesus because that's the way the New Testament refers to them. Those with a tremendous amount of hatred against Jesus and what he taught. They were referred to in the New Testament as the Jews. So the Jews come to Jesus and they ask, who on earth gave you authority to do that? You just said that this was your father's house and it was supposed to be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of robbers. Okay, so show us a sign. Give us a sign to authenticate who you are. And that's when Jesus responded, destroy this temple and I in three days will raise it up. That's the sign that he gives them. Now, if you, we continue in the text, we know that they take that wrong. They think that he's talking literally, but he's not. But here's what I want to point out. Every word in that sentence is important. And every word, especially three of them, the destroy and temple and raise it up, or raise up, that is a single word in um, Greek. All three of those words are somewhat elastic. And, and when I say that a word is elastic, I mean that it can be used in different contexts. For instance, let's just take the word destroy. Now, if we're talking about a body, a person, a human, well, the word destroy means to kill to annihilate, to end the life of. And so that's exactly what's going to happen to Jesus. They're going to end his life. So that's that destroy as far as the body is concerned. But if you're talking about a building, which of course is what the temple is, if you talk about an edifice, to destroy the edifice means to tear it down. Literally stone by stone to dismantle it until it's nothing more than a bunch of rubble on the ground. And those are the two primary ways that that word destroy is being used. But it can also be used of an idea. And when you talk about destroying an idea, what it means is that you destroy the validity of something. It is no longer considered to be valid. But we're going to talk about the idea of worship as well. And then finally, you can destroy a people group. Now, when you destroy a people group, it could be genocide. You could wipe them out. But it can also occur by, by, by redefining, by them no longer being the group that originally they were. So all four of those meanings of destroy are going to be applied to another elastic word, which is the word temple. Because the word temple can mean a variety of things, especially when it is coupled with that word destroy. So going right back through them, Jesus said destroy this temple, talking about the temple of his body. Now wait a minute, before I go further, let me explain one thing about the word destroy. Uh, let me back up here for a minute because this is kind of important. Typically, when we read this sentence, we, we almost act as if it, this destroy is a condition. 
you know, we kind of read in our minds, if you destroy this temple, I will build it back up in three days. Well, that's not the way the word is. The word is actually an imperative. And an imperative is sort of a command. It's an emphatic proclamation that you say to somebody, especially when it's in the second person. Jesus is telling these people who are confronting him, you destroy this temple. Now, he's talking about when he talks about his body, he's saying, hey, kill me. <laughs> now, uh, in a sense... I think he's almost taunting them. I know that Jesus wouldn't taunt them in the negative sense. But I, I think he's, he's saying in a sense that go ahead and kill this body and see what happens. Go ahead and destroy me or think you're going to destroy me and just watch what happens because it's not going to turn out the way you planned. Well, temple can also mean not just a body, but it can also mean actually the meaning that the Jews take is that it's the edifice. The actual word, there's two words for temple. There's one that has the entire complex in mind, including all the courts. And then there's one that just refers to the sanctuary itself. That's the word that Jesus uses. Destroy this temple, this sanctuary, and in three days I will build it back up again or I will raise it up. Now, that's where the Jews say, are you kidding me? It took 46 years to build it to this point and you're going to raise it back up in three days. So, obviously that's not going to happen. We are going to talk later on about... The, the, what happened when that temple was destroyed and what came out of the ashes. But once again, temple can refer to the worship that is, that is accomplished there. In other words, as goes the temple, so goes the worship. Because if you don't have the altar of sacrifice, if you don't have the menorah, which is the presence of God, if you don't have the altar of incense for the prayers, and most specifically, if you don't have the Holy of Holies, guess what? There's not going to be any atonement for sin. So worship is also destroyed with the temple. And then finally... Those who worship in the temple. If there's no longer any temple to worship in, the people who are identified as the worshipers of God through that temple also are destroyed. So you can see that this is a little bit more far-reaching than just to say that, use it as a metaphor. Well, then, the next words that Jesus says in this sentence, and by the way, I'm taking you right through the sentence. I guess you've realized that by now. We go through, and, and that word, when he says that, it, destroy this temple and in three days. Well, I don't know that the Jews would have picked it up yet, but that's a messianic code word. I mean, if they went back to Genesis and the story of Abraham taking Isaac up the mountains to sacrifice him, they would have seen that there were three days prominently listed there. But Jesus himself is the one that really brings it out. He said at another occasion, they came to him and said, hey, show us a sign to authenticate who you are. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. In other words, as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the tomb. So it's, it's sort of a messianic code word whether or not the Jews would have picked it up or not. But then there's the operative word, that, that, that word, I will raise it up. And, and, and he's talking about resurrection there. In other words, there's going to be a destruction. There's going to be a destruction of a temple. And we have all the different kinds of ways. And what we're going to see is in each of the ways that the, just the temple is destroyed, we're going to see it resurrected. First of all, the bodily, physical, historical, supernatural resurrection of the body of Christ. Destroy that temple. Destroy this body. Kill me with violence. And on the third day, I will raise from the grave. That's the resurrection. That's the bodily resurrection that we celebrate on this morning. But, but also, there's going to be a resurrection of 
the place of worship. And that's going to change dramatically, and we're going to talk about that later on. But you remember what Jesus said to that woman at the well, that Samaritan woman? When, when she tried to kind of spar with him theologically, he says, the day is women. Well, let me go ahead and read it to you, for you. He says that the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So we're not going to worship on this mountain, and we're not going to worship on that mountain. The very location of worship, the very place of the temple is going to change, and the whole idea of worship is going to change the way we worship who we worship and how that worship is channeled is not going to be through the temple anymore and as I said we'll see that a little bit later on and also the people there's a new people there's a new church a new kahal and I'll tell you what that means in a moment a new assembly of God's people and out of the ashes of this temple are gonna rise like a phoenix a new people to worship and glorify God. And so therefore, we see that there's quite a bit in this one statement that Jesus makes. Now, just one other thing, and I'm going to try to put it back in perspective for you. Notice that Jesus says, you destroy this temple. So who are the destroyers? It's the Jews. It's them. Now, they're just representative of us. They're just representative of fallen humanity. You destroy this temple. My body, the temple that's here, worship, and the people of God, you destroy it, and who raises it up? Who's the restorer? Now, it's obvious that mankind are the destroyers, and Jesus is the restorer. He's the one who's going to restore things as they should be. But I want you to notice, there's a little irony here. And it happens throughout history, and it is going to happen here, and I'm going to bring out the passage that tells you that it's going to happen. Jesus says that I will restore things by destroying the destruction of humankind. Humankind has destroyed something. I will destroy it. I will stomp on its head, and through that will be restoration. I need to explain that. So let me, let, let me see if I can put that into perspective. Okay, by the way, that's your theology lesson for the day, all right? That, that, that's the technical part. Let, let, let's just kind of step back here and take a broad look at what's going on. Let's go back to the Garden again. Okay, Garden of Eden. What did I tell you about the Garden of Eden? I said that two things were important there. First of all, perfect relationship with God and perfect righteousness. Nothing in between the people and God and no need for a temple. And that is the way things were. God would walk with the garden with them. He would talk to them. He would call the man by name. But then the destroyer entered the garden. And the destroyer has a name. His name is Satan. And we don't know how Satan destroyed his relationship with God. But he enters the Garden of Eden with one thing on his mind, to destroy the relationship between Adam and Eve and therefore all mankind and God. The destruction of that relationship. So from the rest of this morning, when I talk about the destruction of humankind, what I'm talking about is the destruction of the relationship with God. The relationship that is dependent on perfect righteousness, the kind of relationship that we had with God in the garden, it was destroyed. And the destroyer is the one who entered the garden as a snake. And in fact, Jesus told us about him, didn't he? Tenth chapter of John, he says he's a thief and a murderer. He's a thief, and the thief came to do what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. So he's the destroyer, and he taught us to destroy. Through him, through that temptation, we destroyed the relationship that we have with God. Now, there's three things I want you to notice. They can't stay in the garden anymore because the garden and that relationship was a perfect relationship with people, those people who are perfectly righteous. And so they're not perfectly righteous anymore because they've sinned. So therefore, they had to be evicted from the garden. Three things happen. First of all, God takes a couple of the animals and he sacrifices them, right? He, he, now, we'll, we'll let the scholars argue about whether that is a, 
a formal sacrifice, but it's a functional sacrifice. In other words, Adam and Eve, once they sinned, were, were aware of their nakedness. They were, they were covered with their shame. So God sacrificed an animal, spilt its blood, so that he could cover the shame of the man and woman. That's basically what a sacrifice is. It was a substitutional sacrifice to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. Well, that's going to continue throughout redemptive history. The second thing that I want you to um, notice is that when he evicted them from the garden, what did he place at the gate? Two angels with fiery swords. Why were they there? They were there to guard the pathway back to the garden. They were there to say this far and no farther because only perfectly righteous people can enter this garden. So he places two angels there to protect, to keep those who were fallen, those who no longer had that perfect relationship, keep them out of that garden. That's going to become very important later on. Thirdly, right from the beginning, God began his plan of redemption. At the very beginning... As soon as this happened, he began to plot and plan the way that he would restore the relationship and the righteousness of the people who had just sinned against him to restore and reconcile them in a relationship with himself. And the way he did that is Genesis 3.15. Sometimes we call it the protevangelium. And it's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It goes like this. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. He's cursing Satan. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring, singular, is Jesus, the man who is now standing in the temple that, who just said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He's the one who will stomp on the serpent's head. I didn't finish that. He says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So in other words, by crushing, by destroying the destruction of humanity, Jesus will restore the righteousness and the relationship that was lost. Now, that's the eviction from the Garden of, of, of Eden. Now, I can show you throughout history. I'm not going to take the time to do it because from that point on, we begin to get God's plan of redemption as it is unveiled across the millennia. And several times during that time, we see God destroy destruction. So wicked and evil people became and so completely apart from him that he simply destroys their destruction so that he can renew it. He did it with the flood. He did it with the Tower of Babel. He did it in the exile. He did it in 70 AD with, uh, with, with the temple at that time. But God often destroyed man's destruction. But the ultimate destruction is what the rainbow in the sky designates from Noah's um, example because that is going to be the redeemer who is going to come and once and for all destroy destruction but I get ahead of myself let's talk a little bit about how he's going to do that and what does he mean when he says destroy this temple okay he specifically states destroy this temple and I will raise it up well what he's talking about there is sacrificial substitutional atonement because you see, that's what happened at that temple. Now we have to fast forward from the Garden of Eden all the way to when the children of Israel were made a, a, uh, a, a nation. I told you we were through with theology. I didn't tell you we were through with history, okay? This, we're just gonna bring it right back up to Jesus. But anyway, the people of God are standing before Mount Sinai as God comes down upon that mountain. Now, we tend to think about that in the terms of Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, where you see a couple of hundred people at the foot of that mountain. We say, wow, that's really nice, a hundred or so people there. That's not the way it was, folks. About a million and a half people gathered at the base of that mountain. 
Because that's how many people were in that great horde who left Egypt. A million and a half people. The first assembly of God. It was called the Kahal. It was the first church. They gather at the foot of that mountain and God comes down on top of that mountain in power and glory. The mountain shakes. A thick cloud covers it. Fire comes from it. Lightning, thunder, trumpets sound. An earthquake shakes the entire earth. And God comes down upon that mountain and he says, don't touch it. You cannot touch this mountain because I am holy. And this is a holy mountain with me on top of it. So even though I have come to make peace with you, even though I have come to redeem you, to bring you into a relationship with myself, don't touch the mountain because that's the basic problem. You see, God's holiness and our sinfulness, the two can't go together unless something occurs in between. And that's what God did at that time. First of all, he gave us the law. But then he gave them a way that once again, if only temporarily, relationship could be restored. Reconciliation and restoration could be restored. And righteousness, in a sense, for a moment. He gave them the sacrificial system. And in that sacrificial system, Two goats were included in it. One of them killed, the other one sent out the, of the camp. One day a year, Yom Kippur, a priest would go into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in anywhere. It was started out in the tent of meeting. But he would go in there after killing the sacrificial atonement and take the blood, and he would sprinkle it between two angels. Remember, we have two angels at the gate of, of, of Eden. And, and, and any time you want to go back to the garden, you're going to run into those two angels. Well, the way they were doing it is that God said, if you will sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice there once a year, I will forgive. It will be an atonement. It will be a sacrificial, substitutional atonement. I will accept that as payment for the people's sins. And I will declare them righteous at least for a year. It's all temporary. It's not going to last very long. Well, well, that tent went around with them wherever they went. And then later on, Solomon built it into a marvelous, gorgeous temple. And in one of the times that God just simply was fed up with the people's apostasy, he removed his hand of blessing. He allowed the destruction of the relationship between him to be destroyed and that time it was by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And it was laid to waste. The temple itself was truly stone by stone taken down to nothing but rubble. Seventy years later, it started building back up again. And now Herod, for the last 46 years, has been rebuilding that temple so that temple worship, so that temple sacrifices could continue. Now all of that is just so I can explain what Jesus means when he says, Destroy this temple. I mean, that was hugely meaningful to the Jews. Everything in their history was wrapped up in that temple. That's where all of worship was. That's where sacrifices were made. That's where forgiveness was. And Jesus says, you go ahead, tear it down, destroy it. And in three days, I'll raise it back up again. In other words, in three days, I will restore relationship. I will reconcile you to God. I will give you what is necessary for you to enter back in the Garden of Eden. And he did it by doing two things. The first thing that he did is Jesus came to save us. Jesus came as that lamb, as that sacrifice. John the Baptist took one look at him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the sacrificial lamb, the angel who came to Joseph to explain Mary's pregnancy, says you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus himself said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom, a payment for many. For God so loved this fallen, wicked world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's 
what Jesus came to do. It was on that cross that he won forgiveness. He was the sacrificial, substitutional atonement for anyone who places their trust and their belief in him as Savior. He came to forgive sins. But that's not going to get you back in the garden. A lot of people think it will, but it won't. You see, forgiveness of sins is absolutely necessary. That means that everything that you've done against the Holy God has been forgiven. But you see, only perfectly righteous people can ever hope to have a relationship with God. And you may be a redeemed sinner. You may be a forgiven sinner, but you're still a sinner. And you're never going to make it back to the garden. You're never going to make it to the celestial city unless you have perfect righteousness. You can't do it on your own. That's what else Jesus did on the cross. He won for you perfect righteousness. You see, we, we call it double imputation sometimes. We impute our sin to him. God pours his wrath out upon that sin and forgives it. And Jesus imputes his righteousness back to us. That's not fair, folks. That's not just. That's grace. That is the grace of a compassionate and merciful God who wants to reconcile you to himself. And just so you can kind of see the way this turns out, maybe get a little bit of a symbolic view of it. Remember I told you those two angels got left at the garden? No one without righteousness is going back in. And, and, you know, during the time of the Yom Kippur, the priest could get at least to the gate, you know. That's where he would sprinkle the, the, the blood of, of the sacrifice at the gate between the outstretched wings of the, of the cherubim on that mercy seat. But no, no farther than that. Well, when Jesus died, when the debt was paid, when he said to Telestai, it is paid, I've done it. And he breathed his last, that veil that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And when God first told Moses how to make that veil, he said, make sure that you embroider angels all in it. Because when that veil is ripped, the angels will be removed and the path to the garden is restored. I've been talking for about 30 minutes on Easter Sunday morning and I haven't even mentioned the word resurrection yet. But that's the operative word. Don't, don't worry, it's not going to take me 30 minutes to get through this. But the operative word here is resurrection. Because that is what we celebrate. So what is the significance? Remember what Paul said? about the resurrection, if the resurrection is false, if it didn't happen, if we're simply putting our, our belief in a fairy tale, then our faith is worthless and we're all dead in our sins. So the resurrection is absolutely essential. Belief in the resurrection is absolutely essential to Christianity. You cannot have Christianity without the resurrection. So why is it so important? And what is the significance? Well, if I can, I'd like to just explain it using those Four ideas, those four different elastic words for destroy, temple, and resurrection. First of all, the resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ. Once again, the historical, physical, bodily, supernatural resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. What is the significance of that? Let me just give you three, three ideas. First of all, it says, proves... That Jesus is everything he said he was, and he did everything that he said he came to do. Jesus said, I'm the Son of God. To Philip, he said, Philip, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. To the, two, to the Jews in John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. In, in verse eight of John, or chapter 8 of John, he says, before Abraham was, I am. In the first chapter of John, John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Jesus is God. If he wasn't, if he was just a liar or a lunatic or deluded with visions of grandeur, God would not have raised him from the grave. So the fact that God raised him from the grave proves that he's everything that he said he was. It also proves that he did everything that he said he came to do. He said the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 
I have come not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Jesus said, I came to save you. If you will put your trust in me, if you will believe in me, if you will have me as your Savior and as your Lord, then I will save you. I will redeem you. I will restore you. And the fact that God raised him from the dead means every single word of that is true. Or else he would have left him in the grave. But thirdly, I mean, I'm secondly. The second reason this is so important is because it proves that God accepts his sacrifice on your behalf. A lot of people don't think about this. But let's say that you owe me money. So you owe me five bucks. Okay? And, and, and then somebody else comes up and says, you know something? They're having a hard time right now. I'll, I'll pay back their five bucks. Right? I'll, I'll take their debt on myself. Well, if I look at you and, and, and I determine that the reason you hadn't paid me back my five bucks is because you're lazy and you're sitting around all day and you're not getting out trying to raise that five dollars, I might say, no, I'm sorry. I appreciate the gesture, but I'm not going to accept it because this person needs to pay their own debt. Well, our debt is against God. We sin against God. David says that every single sin I have sinned against you and you only I have sinned. So we owe God a debt. And if Jesus goes to the cross and pays for that debt, God has to say, I accept it. He never would have raised Jesus from the grave if he hadn't accepted the sacrifice that should condemn you should condemn those who put their trust in him. If he hadn't accepted it, he'd still be in the grave. The third thing that it proves is that he lived a perfect life, absolutely perfect. And you say, how on earth does that prove it? Well, Paul told us that the wages of sin is death. And back in the garden, God says, don't touch the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Death is the curse of the fall. And if Jesus had done one sin, one transgression, one time in omission, commission, thought, word, or deed, he would still be in the grave. Because it would go against the very dictates and the proclamation of God to raise him up. Because he would be a sinner and death is for sinners. But as it is, he, oh yeah, he had sin upon him when he was on the cross, but it was my sin and yours. It, it, it wasn't his sin. He saw no corruption in the grave because he wasn't the sinner. The grave wasn't made for people who were sinless. So he was raised from the grave. Now, all of those are just kind of a, a, a view of why the bodily resurrection of Jesus is so important. But what about the, what about the temple? He says, destroy this temple. It could mean the edifice that was there. And I will, in three days... Raise it up again. Now, of course, the Jews took that literally. But what Jesus is meaning, in a sense, is there's going to be a new kind of worship. And it's not going to be here. It's going to be a different place that we worship. It's not going to be on this mountain. It's not going to be on that mountain. The, those who worship God are going to worship him in spirit and truth. And the temple that I am going to lay is the one who is standing right there in the temple. Peter says this, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. In other words, the air is a new temple, and it is the body of Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to say, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Jesus is the new temple. He's also the new worship. You see, there's a new kind of worship. We worship in spirit and truth. Beautifully symbolized by the paraphernalia in the old temple. One of the, one of the pieces of furniture, if you will, was called the menorah. A golden lampstand with seven lamps. Perfect number representing the presence of the spirit of God. But there's one stalk. There's one column. They all came together in that one column, meaning there's one place that God can be worshipped right here in Jerusalem. Well, when we get to Revelation and, and, and we see John's vision, he sees a vision of Jesus. 
He sees one like the Son of Man standing in the midst of not one lampstand, but seven. Same concept, seven perfect. This is the Spirit of God. But now it's Jesus in the midst of it. And so therefore, there's a new temple, a new temple that is being built with living stones. You and I, if you are trusting in Christ, we are the living stones that make the temple. This building is not the church. The church is the people of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one that holds it all together. Now all of a sudden, there's a new people too. You see, before there was an ethnicity to it. There was a, a requirement of circumcision that defined you as the people of God. Well, now there is a new definition. It is not ethnic. It is not physical. It is to believe and trust and proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ and Jesus as the resurrected Savior of your soul. That is what the people of God is ident are identified by. And it's not in one place. It is every tribe, every nation, every race, every ethnicity, every color, every language. People from every walk of life in all the corners of the world now make up the people of God. That's what the resurrection means, folks. Powerful, powerful statement. But there's one more thing that the resurrection tells us. As I said earlier, it tells us without question that Jesus spoke the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John says, he is the, he is the, we have seen his glory. The glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is truth. There's no lie in him. Now, when we fast forward to the end of time, when we fast forward to that glorious return to the garden, when I talk about return to the garden, I'm talking about heaven. We don't know what heaven's going to look like. We have a very apocalyptic view of it in Revelation. I tend to think it's going to look like it originally did because when God says it's very good, how much better can you get than that? But nonetheless, when we are there, righteousness and relationship are restored. There has been a restoration because of forgiveness and imputed righteousness. The redemption of Jesus Christ has led to restoration, reconciliation, and relationship once again. There is no temple because there doesn't need to be because God and the Lamb are there. And there's no need to have a place where you go to worship. There's one word missing. There's one word that you will not find there. And that's the word destruction. Because destruction is over. There, 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 there will be no destroyers in that place. There will be none who are at enmity with God. Only those who are at enmity with the destroyer himself. And so therefore, before that comes, comes the destruction of man's destruction. It's the judgment. Now once again, I want to remind you something. Jesus cannot lie. The fact that he is not in that tomb, and I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, if he had been in that tomb, they would have paraded his body around, and Christianity would have died in its infancy. But he wasn't in that tomb because he was raised from that tomb. And because he was raised, we know that he speaks the truth. And these are the words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. Sheep representing those that he has destroyed their destruction. Those who have relationship with with him, those he has imputed his righteousness and forgiven their sins. Those are the sheep. Those go with him. He says, I have prepared a place for you that where I am there you may be also. He's prepared a place for the sheep. But those who don't know him, those who have not had their destruction destroyed are cast into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. No one talked more about hell than the man who cannot lie. No one talked more about hell and judgment and damnation than the man who God has affirmed told the truth. Paul says that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
Every single one of us will stand there. My question for you this morning, and I'll end with this. Has Jesus destroyed your destruction? Don't fool yourself. Don't try to tell yourself you're such a good person that you don't need to worry about that. I mean, come on. Be real. Look at yourself. Look at the, the nature of sinfulness against the perfect and the holy God. You have sinned more this morning than you can shake your finger at. Has Jesus destroyed your destruction? Because you have spent all day, all your life, destroying your relationship with God. And the only way that that is going to be restored is if the restorer, the resurrected one, restores and destroys your destruction. So on this Easter resurrection Sunday morning, and I hope that I have made it clear enough and important enough how important this resurrection is, I'll just leave you with this question. Has Jesus destroyed your destruction? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we <clears throat> close with that poignant thought, that question, after seeing all of this extraordinary history, and, and I just skated across the surface of it, as you know, it, it's so much deeper and fuller and richer than that. I just pray that I have been able to articulate the significance of the resurrection to every single one of us, and that all will put their faith in you and what you did on the cross and be the benefactors of your destruction. In Christ's name we pray, amen.